Let me know when really, Scrooge? Goes. It seems like it bears the exact same seal that all the other coins did. It, and by that, what, I mean no seal at all, because they're all the exact same 3D model. We don't see what Scrooge sees. For all we know, this could be one of those awesome sun coins from the sun people when they went searching for that, like, lost Aztec temple of gold. He has, like, a money vision, where he exactly. can see the individual value of every single coin. You say that like he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, the, the score meter up up yonder is literally a counter of how much money you have. Mm. That's oh, like God. what he actually sees. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's how Scrooge sees the world. <laughs> He's got a money counter. You know, it's like those stock It's exchanges. like his life force. You run out of cash, he just falls over and dies. <laughs> exactly. His life is like one of those stock exchanges where you see the money go up and down constantly. <laughs> well, that's the reason he'll never die exactly because oh wow here's another good point yeah because scrooge pretty much is the this world source of capita like, it's like the he's like the south sea trading company he's actually worth more than the entire national economy combined because because if you recall the uh, history source, joke because if you recall the source of his income is his lucky coin hmm Oh, well, the source of his luck is his lucky coin. It's the reason he's so wealthy to begin with. Things just tend to go his way because he owns it. Which is he... actually a concept they borrowed from... What's his name? Uh, Donald's rival. Gladfoot? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was originally his shtick, is that he had this, uh, he had this luck that they could not explain for whatever reason. Uh-huh. And they decided to give it a purpose in here because dra dramatics, and I don't know. Again, this is thinking about things from the perspective of a developer and the yeah. perspective of a designer, where it might just be more fun if you don't explain things. Like, life you know? just kind of goes a certain way sometimes. Oh, entirely. Also, that big, awesome pyramid in the background makes me think of Banjo-Tooie, where you control that giant Aztec robot. Mmm... I'm just expecting those robots to get up and just start wrecking shit. Like that sort of Dexter's lab when he brings George Washington to life from, from Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I remember that, actually. That was such a cool fight. It was so cool. Yeah, Mandark brings Washington alive and has him destroy Dexter's house. Well, at least like a quarter of it. No one bats an eyelash because, you know, it's Dexter's lab. It's hilarious like that. Yeah. But then Dexter brings Lincoln alive to do battle with George Washington. <laughs> and it just ends with both of them saying, looks like we are evenly matched. Yes, I cannot tell a lie. Wait, you can't tell a lie? Neither can I. Oh, really? Do, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically, see, you're telling me all this and you essentially just explain the plot of Codename Steam. Yep. <laughs> I haven't even seen the game. It's 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 not a good game. Like it's but, it's produced well and I get where they were going with it, but it is ridiculously hard. And the worst part is whenever I die in that game, I never feel like it's my fault. And it's set up in such a way that the enemy will get reinforcements too, and a lot of them. If even one of your party members goes down, you are fucked for the rest of the mission. There is no way you can catch back up. Your characters just do not have the stamina or firepower to do it. Wow. You see, when you said I described Codename Steam, I thought you were going to, I thought the story was going to entail your, your party members forming this Gurren Lagann giant steampunk Abe Lincoln. There is a steampunk Abe Lincoln in that game. Yeah. This is called the ABE. Hell yeah! I forget what the acronym stands for. I never got that far, though. Awesome because excellent. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, STEAM itself is an acronym for uh, Soldiers... Uh, no, Strike Team Eliminating the Alien Menace. There we go. That's, oh. that's what it is. Let's see here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, before we close out. Okay. Really? We're done with this episode already? No, 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 I'm, 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 we got about uh, five minutes left. We got five minutes. Okay, I was about to say, but we just ended the last one. Yeah, you know, I am. I was thinking of something else. Um, oh, yeah, the subject of a character's age. For me, I am of the weird subcategory where if the character is 16 and up, you can do whatever, because that's the age you can drive a car and actually make adult decisions. Hmm. 
And, you know, because you know, that's the age where a lot of teenagers start to start dating and whatnot. And as I've said before, it's weirdly enough the age of consent here in Ohio. So maybe <laughs> that's also something to do with it. But it's like, if, if they're 16 and old enough to make decisions behind the wheel of a car, you can have a story where they start dating and whatnot and, yeah. un- and start discovering their own sexuality. It's <laughs> still a bit squicky. It's still, it's still a gray area. I totally hear you there. It's it it like I I say this without without any ease because again it's like super gray area it has to be handled properly. Like yeah, any, it's one like of those anything. things where the whole sexuality thing has to be a trait of the character. It's like Sanji in Persona Four. Oh hell yeah! Like let let's not even mince words about this. Sanji is gay. Yep. Okay, but the fact that he's gay and that he's wrestling with his sexuality and societal pressure. Like, he has to go through all that, and that actually plays into the whole persona aspect that the series is already really thick on. Yeah. That's a... That's a really interesting character dynamic. I mean, without that, he'd just be a tough guy with a big heart, and we've seen that trait over and over and over and over. And hang on a yeah. second. Before we go any further, do you remember this part in the original game where the statue would actually say, Hey, you gotta pay a toll before you get through here. No, go on. Well, you owe me a debt, pal, and I intend to collect! Yeah! Oh no, it froze! No! <laughs> no! Right at that moment? Are you serious? Yes! No. <laughs> go figure. The gods are trying to punish me for my stance on a character's sexualization. You won't silence me! Yeah. <laughs> Because again, it's like we said, if it's a trait of that character, it's clearly not being transposed on them. Like uh, Jim Sterling said about Bayonetta, she's still got autonomy and is very much still herself, and she acts the way she does because this is clearly the way she wants to act, and not because it's just the fetish of the creator. More, you know, more power to you. If there's a character, that's just how they act. But, you know, if it's if we had Sanji from Persona 4 just act gay because they wanted a a bear, basically, then that's when you start getting into some messed up territory. Yeah, it's, you gotta be really careful with that kind of thing. It's not something a rookie writer should tackle by any means, in any way, shape, or form. You've gotta be extremely tactful about that kind of thing, extremely respectful. This is why whenever you see somebody tackling a game that's about World War II or something like Valiant Hearts, which was one of my favorite games of last year, they put Uh an incredible amount of care into communicating to you exactly what it was like to live in this time period. Mm -hmm. Because if they had it, it would have seemed disrespectful. And it's the reason why I was one of the few people, it seemed, that was behind the idea of actually bringing six days in Fallujah to life because those the developers behind that game were actually talking to the guys who were in that event they were Mm -hmm. trying to get first-hand accounts from those dudes and pay respect because if you think about it the best way anybody could actually experience that event I think video games are great for understanding history for telling historical stories Because if you get all of the details right, there would be no better way to actually live. There's no better way to understand history than to live through it, I feel. And video games are a perfect avenue to do that because they're so great at transporting us to another world to begin with. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Oh, entirely. I remember uh, you said it in, uh, in your rant about it's just a game. Yeah. Oh, you've seen that already. That was awesome. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, video games are an interactive medium. They're, you are, hold on. Yeah, they're an interactive medium. You are, you're basically taking, you basically, uh, let's see. How you I are the character. You're taking yeah. the role of everything they do, which mm-hmm. is the whole point. So putting you in the shoes of somebody who actually had to survive in a concentration camp or actually had to live through... This is also why this War of Mine is such an interesting game, because they're right. Their tagline is totally valid and correct. In war, not everybody is a soldier. Yeah, oh god, is that ever right. Oh god, is that ever right. So I just remembered some bad some bad pictures I saw back in high school. Ugh. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all about just being respectful. It's all about... It's 
Yeah, you get what I'm trying to say. I don't, I don't want to push this any farther, because it feels like we've been talking about it forever. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. It's not the manner... It's not the medium we use to talk about something. It's how much res respect we treat it with. It's how much we pay tribute to the source material, if you will, that, di that dictates whether or not we're treating the subject with respect. Yeah. That's the note I'm going to end this off on. Yeah. And, yeah, in fact, I'll just add one, one minor note that comes back full circle. Mm -hmm. It's why Mary Sue characters are so bad, is because they're not characters who are treating the subject matter with any respect whatsoever. Yeah. Unless they're a deconstruction, like you were saying in that one comic. Oh, yeah, it, I'll, I'll link you that. You're going to love this. <laughs> I often do love meta humor, so. <laughs> ah, oh, um. Oh, yeah. Weirdly enough, coming back to meta, like. Good. Another game we have to play soon is one of the Kim Possible games. Really? Yes. You're gonna have to. Ru you're really gonna have to sell me on this one. What's it about, and why should I care? Well, there's a game where I think it's for PS2. Um, it's where basically Ron and Draken switch minds, so Kim and she go have to team up. And if I recall, it's a platforming game where you take on the role of both of those characters. And basically, I just want to play as Shigo. And I'm going to drag you into this so that I can live out that desire. <laughs> it's always about you, isn't it? After spending those years in that box in your attic, I think I'm entitled to a little bit of special treatment. A little bit of executive decision making. I was in a... We still go out, but we never laugh anymore, Ralph. Why don't you look at me, Doring? <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of looking real quick, uh, have you finished the boss battle? That I, I just did, and we're watching the outro cutscene right now. While that's happening, I must have video feed. <laughs> sure thing. Thank you. Let me just... This is actually really great, what the characters say during all this. Oh, look at them, they're so cute! Oh, it came back for you? Yep. So I switched over the TV for nothing. Awesome. Yeah, it's like... Like, it's working. It's it's hand in the weird, but... Hey, we're gonna... It, we're like, gonna disappears make it for a little bit and then comes back. Yeah, it's like... It cuts out what it wants to cut out. It's like, nah, you just can't see this part of the game. It, it's like in Banjo-Kazooie. Well, I did have a T-Rex spell. That's far too awesome for just this game. <laughs> <laughs> What? An entire boss fight? Nah, no, that's too good for this stream. Oh, yeah, it's like, hmm, that draw man guy, see, he's a real, he's a real, he's a real dustpan. It is yours. Take it and go in peace. After all, it was just the old king's back scratcher. Yeah, I love that. I love this. It's like that's this. such a Disney cartoon joke, too. I know. It's like, yeah, there's this incredible treasure that has this gigantic diamond on the top of it, but nah, we don't want it. It's like... I guess it, I, it's sort of the one man's trash is another man's treasure type thing, and they did that in the mines, too. Where they're talking, where the underground people, I forget their exact species name, they even <laughs> said it, too, but... They said, oh, garbage rocks? Oh, we have no use for garbage rocks. Yeah. Tell you what, I'll dispose of those for you if you like, if you just promise not to bother my miners. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh, another great bit from the show was, um... Oh, wait, hold on. I'll actually tell that on the next episode. Alright, next episode of Team Pizza Plays. More telling things. <laughs>